satellite tracking is helping farmers in Queensland and New South Wales tackle a major pest. Feral pigs destroy crops and trash the viability of many farms. But a new program is leaving them with nowhere to hide and enhancing our understanding of how they move. More from Landline's Sean Murphy. They're hand feeding cattle in the northwest of New South Wales, and feral pigs are filling their bellies with the precious drought rations meant for hungry livestock. It's an ideal place for Darren Marshall to set his traps. Pigs are really opportunistic, you know. They're just chasing that protein so they can keep that 15% protein so that they can, they can breed. And they really don't mind what they eat, from, from dead animals to carcasses to an ideally a wheat or sorghum crop. Around here, cotton as well. But because things are so tough, they're into the cattle tucker. Darren traps pigs for science. For two years, he's been capturing them under contract to try to learn more about how to control them. Done. Geez, how good's that, eh? Huh? Come over here, mate. The idea is to use science to motivate landholders to participate in coordinated control. Yep. The big problem out here is to some people and some enterprises, feral pigs are a massive issue. People are taking devastating agricultural losses to, to all of their crops, like cotton, sorghum, wheat. But then we have other enterprises that the pigs don't really have an impact on. So because they don't have that impact, those landholders aren't as motivated to take as much action. So far, he's recorded data on more than 120 pigs at four locations in New South Wales and Queensland. But this is the centrepiece of the research project, GPS satellite tracking collars that can record where pigs go and when they go there. This collar will take a GPS point every half an hour. And then every six hours, it'll transmit up to a satellite and come back to us. The early results have been groundbreaking and the project has been expanded to nine locations in those two states. Uh, the biggest thing that surprised me is how little the pigs move. So this is one site, we have nine others, and on all of those sites, pigs aren't moving great expansive distances. You always hear stories about pigs living in the national park and travelling 30, 40 kilometres a night to come and smash a crop, and then travelling back. We're just not seeing that. If a pig has food, water and shelter, we're not seeing pigs move very far at all. Pig numbers continue to grow even in the grip of drought. They are prolific breeders. Sows are capable of producing two litters every year with up to 10 viable piglets each in a good year. They're adding to the burden for farmers unable to grow crops and struggling to feed their livestock. Up and see if that brings those numbers back down a bit. Jason Phillips runs an 1800 hectare cropping operation between Moree and Narrabri. Even with the best advice from agronomist Tony Lockery, he's been unable to grow any winter crops this year. Not only Jason, we, uh, we go sorghum and mung beans ago here the last couple of years and we had them flogged by pigs. Jason had just enough rain to grow a summer cotton crop, but pigs ate out 100 hectares. We sort of estimate that it would be somewhere in the 200,000 a year um, that we'd lose to pig damage. We've had uh, people uh, stay and shoot, we've had helicopters, we've had bait, we've done a lot of things, but we haven't managed to um, keep, the, keep the crop damage um, down. So that's um, one thing that we're hoping to fix. Okay, 
So it was, it was two years ago. I think I stood up here and I said we're going to do a project for six months. Um, <laughs> and the collars, the collars, you know, we said that because we thought the collars would last for about that amount of time, but they didn't. They just kept going and going and going and going. And we'll, we'll, we'll show Community that. engagement is a key part of Darren Marshall's so we'll, project. We'll go through that. He's hoping so the new research will help groups um, like the Northwest years, Local you know, Area Land that. Service. Got a Hopefully tonight we'll just see where those hot spots are. I'm going to go through each pig, have a look, show you where they are. It'll be relevant to your own properties. The, every line there, every squiggle that you see moving is, is an individual pig. They're really creatures of habit, you know? They're just really shooting back and forth. They're going back to key points. And those key points, we have to work out what they are in the landscape, because I reckon that's where we need to hit them. The information that Darren and the project have been able to generate is, it's world class. We don't have anything like that sort of information to draw on. So to have that and to have it locally here, to be able to see the home range of the pigs that we're dealing with, uh, to be able to see their, their habits, uh, where they're camping, where they're feeding, where they're watering, makes it, um, we'll be much more targeted in how we, how we look to manage the pigs in this area. Like I'd normally shoot 2,000 pigs a year in that area and we probably didn't get quite that many because of the extra baiting. Tony Lockery is a contract aerial shooter as well as an agronomist. He reckons landholders are already seeing benefits from working together. When we first started shooting it was more on a paddock basis and it just, we weren't winning at all. The shoot that we did associated with this project was 25,000 hectares, there was 30 odd growers involved. So. That's the sort of um, scale that we need to operate on. This is perfect, Sean. There's a pig pad here. We'll be able to use this to set the camera. OK, good. Darren Marshall has added infrared cameras to his research base to give farmers evidence on the impact control measures are having. This is a good trick? Yep, this, is, this will work well for us. 40 trigger movement cameras are set on a grid pattern. Each can hold 60,000 images. The idea is to record pig numbers before and after any baiting, trapping and shooting programs. So indicatively we can go back to landholders and say this is the percentage of feral pigs that you took out using this control method. Not everyone is convinced that a cooperative pig management program will work. Glenn Finance has invested half a million dollars in total exclusion fencing on a quarter of his family's 5,000 hectares. They've been big supporters of community-wide pig control, but Glenn reckons these fences are the only surefire solution. Oh, it's been absolutely fantastic for us. Uh, it's the only way we've been able to totally control the cropping areas. We had a sorghum crop last year. Here I would not have contemplated growing without the fence just would have been wiped out completely. So for us, it's great. Certainly the, the cost is a big issue. It is a big cost. The data suggests that you need to eradicate 90% of the pigs to really be effective. Do you think that's viable? No, I don't. I just don't think we can do it. Um, collectively, people just don't get together and do this sort of thing. You've got farmers that are, they have issues at time of crop. They don't seem to want to do it all year round. We have graziers special cattle blokes that it's just not as big an issue for them. So I, I, see every, I see that as being a very big struggle. Not all the pigs Darren Marshall captures are released, but even in death, they yield important data. What we're testing for is um, leptospirosis and brucellosis, both of which can be transferred to cattle and to people. Both cause abortions. And um, it's, it's, it has big impact on cattle herds. We've basically found that a quarter of the pigs we've tested around here are carrying leptospirosis and only about four to five percent carrying brucellosis. Darren Marshall says these images of pigs invading a cattle feedlot are a reminder of their potential to spread disease.
we need to let the landholders know exactly what the threats are. And, you know, we're seeing African swine fever. It's massive. It's, it's spreading across the rest of the world really quick. And it's a massive threat to Australia. And if it did get here, um, you know, feral pigs are, are a major vector for something like that. So I think it's important that we tell people what those risks are. Yeah, well, it's interesting to see where he's, where he's moved and, like, and if he's gone down to the Horton, you know, he, he could pick up disease, bring it back to my place or take it over to the feedlot. Yep. Daryl Mitchell cows, runs just... sheep and cattle near Moree. Last year, when Landline visited his farm, he helped capture this 88-kilogram boar. They called him Salvador and his travels yielded good information before he was shot 10 months later. 88. Very useful, very surprising, you know, very interesting. How will it change your approach to your pig control? Well, it, it, you know, it shows you where, where the, the, the hot spots are, where they all live and, and their, their range. So then if they go in a certain direction, we can um, trap or poison, you know, in that areas where they, they move around and, uh, yeah, it makes it a lot easier. It's early days yet, but Darren Marshall reckons information will be the best weapon in the war against feral pigs. So you're calling this a war against feral <laughs> yeah. pigs. Can you win it? <laughs> it's, it's difficult. Um, I believe we can have a massive impact on feral pigs. We can control feral pigs. The difficulty is getting people motivated to work together. So this project of using science to get them motivated, it might not be the only way to do it or the best way to do it, but for me, the, the challenge in winning the war is getting people to work together, not the methods of how to kill pigs.